Welcome to PyCon, first, first non-keynote session. So first up, we have Josh Simmons. Josh is a community organizer and web developer. He currently serves as a board member for the Open Source Initiative and is a program manager at Google's Open Source Programs Office. Please welcome Josh and his talk, Why Would New Developers Choose Django? Excellent. Thank you all for joining me today, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, it's an honor to have a full room, especially for a new talk I'm trying to kick the tires on. Now, this is going to be kind of a different talk. This isn't going to be all me broadcast. Uh, this is going to be somewhat interactive. I'll be asking questions and taking notes to further the research that this is based on. So a little background information. Um, when I was working at O'Reilly Media, I was a community manager for web development and open source. Uh, and so in that role, I was doing research on various web technology communities to see how they stacked up um, against each other and also just to explore what people's favorite frameworks, content management systems, websites, to you know, just get a sense of what the environment was like in each of those um, each of the ecosystems around major languages like Python, PHP, Perl, uh, Ruby, etc. So this talk is based on the the things that the, the responses I got from people uh, about why they liked the languages they worked in, what the things were that frustrated them about those languages and the tools. Um, and so this is a subset of that information that I learned about Python and Django. So my hope is to continue this research uh, and make it available for communities so that they can see how they compare, how they can improve to be more uh, noob friendly, basically, and how they can grow their project over time. Because, of course, even with a healthy project like Django, uh, we need to maintain that momentum. We need new blood on a constant basis to bring in new perspectives, solve new problems. Uh, so being new friendly and making sure that we understand why people choose the frameworks and tools that they do helps us, uh, helps us bridge that gap. So just a little housekeeping. Thank you, corporate overlords. Um, I've worn many hats. I still wear quite a few. Uh, today, I'm wearing the hat of Joshua Simmons, community organizer and web developer. Um, nothing I say represents any employer, past, present, future. Um, with that said, I should also say that these slides won't be available. Again, thank you, corporate overlords. Uh, but they will all be in the video. And frankly, the slides are pretty minimal on content. They're really just a foil for us to have a conversation for me to share some thoughts that I've, uh, uh, thoughts and findings. Um, of course, this session, we're gonna try to use the full 30 minutes. Uh, again, it's not broadcast, it's gonna be a bit of a discussion. So there's not gonna be a discrete Q&A period. So raise your hand at any time. Uh, we'll take the question or, or discussion point. With that said, I also welcome points of discussion, points of information. This isn't a place where um, I only welcome questions, right? Because I'm trying to learn from you as much as I'm trying to share with you. Uh, lastly, I am really not hard to find if you want to reach out after the fact. I'm sure I'll be putting around the hallways and uh, Twitter, IRC, et cetera. Find me. I'm not, not hard to find. OK. Uh, without further ado, Let's just talk about a little bit about where new developers come from, right? Everybody has a different path into web development. And a few that, are, uh, that I've experienced, that I've seen, come from uh, people who get into design, for instance. And when they're a freelance designer, they may have a need to do some coding. And they may find that that's something that they enjoy more than the design elements of their work. So they may cross over and become a web developer. Um, of course, there are students. I think that is the most obvious path uh, for people getting into development or any, any industry, any field of practice. Students also come from many backgrounds, but if they're in web development, they're often in a CS program or some sort of media studies with a bent uh, on technology. There are also a lot of enthusiasts and business owners who get into web development just because they're looking to scratch their own itch. Right? If you're a, a small business owner, you may not have the income or the, the revenue to pay uh, an agency or a web developer to build something. And you may not be pleased with the options like Squarespace, Wix, whatever. Um, you may want to build something of your own. So a lot of people who 
are just computer enthusiasts or looking to meet their own needs get into web development that way. And lastly, software developers crossing to the dark side. And I note software developers because web development is not like software development. There are a lot of lessons that translate, uh, but the web is a really funky place and the medium uh, dictates. Um, you don't have a lot of control over the environment that the website operates in, at least on the front end. So there, there are big differences there. So this is where I'm going to ask uh, the first question, which is, I want to know where some of you have come from, how you got into web development. Um, we'll take a, hopefully a few people are brave and will raise their hands and offer that up. You, sir. Um, I was a journalist and I wanted to make maps and charts, so I started using C3 and JavaScript. Uh -huh. So journalists who wanted to make maps and charts and got into D3. Beautiful. All right, surely there. Um, a long time ago, I first started playing with HTML last century. Um, so that's sort of how I started with the web, but um, I don't really know why, because it was kind of cool. Donna got into it because it was fun. I think that's uh, that's not. I think that speaks for for a number of folks. I know. Um, <laughs> I was always surprised at how many people got into web development just because they had uh, spruced up their MySpace page or something and copied and pasted enough code and tweaked enough things to realize, oh, like there's something, there's a discrete universe here I can control and maybe I could do more with it. If I could get like three other uh, volunteers here. Yes, sir. Not that dissimilar in that it started like a dip. I'm more of a electronics and software developer, but I've been sort of dipping into HTML and then other websites over the years. Build one for myself or small business, or then still just microservices now to put a web front end on devices being built. Right. That, I think that's a really interesting one that we will probably see more and more of as we have this whole Internet of, Internet of Things. Um, thing explode, uh, more front ends and UIs for uh, either consuming the data produced by devices um, or just, just managing the devices themselves. Thank you. All right, we have a full room, two more people. Who's it going to be? So I got to the end of my first year of computer science and wanted to actually build things that people could use and then realized that the web was really the only way to do that unless you really want to get into like Windows software packaging and so on. Uh -huh. So yeah, just started making websites for friends and so on. And that's something I can, I can particularly relate to. Uh, I spent some time doing C++ uh, and QBasic because why not? Uh, but the moment you discover that you can do web development and you can hit save and refresh and suddenly you've got like a, a very immediate feedback loop, uh, it's a really gratifying process. All right, one more volunteer. Where'd you come from? So for my undergrad project, I had to build um, a, plat a web platform which would collect data from Raspberry Pi and plot it. So yeah, from that I started using Plotly as well as D3. So yeah. Excellent. All right, thank you all for sharing. So I think the reason that we ask this question and that we consider this um, is that we come from different backgrounds and people have different needs as they get into projects. Um, as you'll note, the things that I had listed there are things that you know, people are going to have wildly varying uh, skill levels in terms of technology, right? A designer may be facile with Photoshop or GIMP, but they may not necessarily be uh, comfortable on a command line. They may not be used to looking at markup, let alone uh, logic in code. And so what that informs, for, what that does for us is that informs how we can reach out to these people and what kind of documentation and tutorials uh, are useful for these folks as we, uh, as we help them get involved with the project. Maybe not as contributors, but at least as users. Okay, so moving on, um, let's talk a little bit about how people evaluate frameworks and content management systems. Now there's a lot of knowledge out there about how folks evaluate uh, an open source project. Um, there's research that's gone into this, there's the uh, software maturity, something or other life cycle 
it's got a long name, but this is, this is a well-studied area. Um, we're not really addressing that here because the reality is most folks, when they're getting into web development, aren't familiar with this, this history of research. And frankly, it's awfully academic. It's not um, terribly approachable. And so uh, what we have here are a number of considerations that people will, uh, people bear in mind uh, when the need arises for them to build a website, right? So one of the things I didn't mention in the previous slide, uh, oftentimes a website, web application gets built because a marketing agency needs it for a client, right? And so they hire a developer, they have an in-house developer, and they're forced to make a choice right there. Uh, so they, no they may not have the time or wherewithal to do this kind of in-depth research. So these are the kinds of things that they may be thinking about. Uh, popularity. That's an easy one, right? How much have you heard about it? Uh, how many resources can you find about it online when you search for it? Documentation. How good is the documentation? Um, this is not just the how to contribute or how to use. Um, this is also the, uh, the tutorials and the books and videos and other resources that are out there uh, that will help people learn how to use a project. Uh, Beyond documentation, we have uh, out of the boxiness, technical term. Um, out of the box is, a, is something that's really important for a lot of uh, use cases, right? One of the reasons that WordPress is so popular is that you install it and while Python has batteries included in terms of a standard library, WordPress has batteries included in terms of a, a framework and CMS um, and really nothing, nothing uh, compares to that. So, while it may be uh, very useful to have a fairly lean or Spartan framework, uh, it's also very useful for other use cases to have a lot that's included or a lot that you can turn on uh, the first time you install it. Now, out of the boxiness is not just about what's, what kind of features or modules, plugins, whatever, are included with the framework itself. This is also about how easy is it to install and how common are the environments in which you install it. And I think this is one of the reasons why uh, WordPress is so, uh, so prevalent, ditto Drupal, is that PHP uh, LAMP shared web hosting is practically a commodity. Um, thank you, Apache and Linux. And so we see a lot of those out there just because it's so easy to install those. Security and stability. Now, these are I list security first because stability is not as easy to measure. Um, stability you might measure in terms of, you might look at what the release cycle is like, you might look at whether the project values, um, whether the project makes breaking changes. You know, you look at say Angular to Angular 2, that's a project with a certain philosophy. Um, and so they'll make breaking changes between versions and the upgrade path is non-trivial. So stability might be measured in that way. But security is really the thing that people are thinking about when they're not familiar with assessing these things. Um, because there's nothing so scary as hacking when you really aren't familiar with what security is in the first place. Um, and for instance, WordPress is often in tech news for its vulnerabilities. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. Extensibility in the con contrib ecosystem. This goes without saying, but the more code that's out there that can be added on to a project, uh, the more attractive it is for, for a user uh, or developer, right? They don't want to have to reinvent the wheel, so the more wheels that are out, them, uh, out there for them to use, the better. Community. Uh, this is one that uh, I am working on figuring out how to measure. I have a few ideas, but the research is for me at least is really nascent here. But community is, is critical. Uh, community is about how friendly people are, how inclusive it is, uh, how vibrant the event ecosystem is, uh, how, uh, how the online forums are, whether that's IRC, Slack, Twitter, et cetera. Um, so these are the things that, that folks uh, that come to mind really immediately for folks as they're assessing projects. Uh, I want to take a moment here to invite people to suggest other things that might be considered. Donna. Uh, yes. This. Oh. Um, so something that I use is 
when the last commit was. Um, Because if it hasn't been committed on for like a year, that probably means it's not going to be committed on again. So I won't look at it. Um, it, It's a really crude metric, but it is one that I do look at for things. Absolutely. Thank you for that. We have a couple over here. Uh, Meeting, checking the arbitrary boxes on a checklist. You've been given a list of things you have to meet and... You have to go and check that they have all those things. Ah, right, right. Uh, I'll springboard off of the first comment that uh, not only when was the last commit, but who was it by. Um, a, a lot of the times when large corporations uh, have the chuck things over the wall model of open source contribution, um, if they are the only ones touching the repo, it might stop at any time. Aha, that's a very good one. Thank you, Sam. I think we had one in the back. I understand this is a um, about developers choosing a framework, but one of the things that we come across is convincing clients that Django is the way to go, as opposed to WordPress and all the other frameworks. Right. Uh, one of the things we've done to make it quicker is build a whole load of apps that allow you to um, have those modules straight away. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, something that's not on your list is language. Um, uh-huh. I might evaluate based on language, particularly if my operating system doesn't support whatever it's implemented in. Absolutely. Thank or Python. That. Right. All right, take this one last one. Something that people will probably consider is their past experience because if people have had a, ba- a bad experience deploying an application, that will tarnish their view. If they've had a good experience, they will reuse it. If they're a new developer, they may not have the experience to make a complete and fair assessment of the software and they won't know what they're picking. Right. And if they're an experienced developer, they may be the product of their part, their, their loves or other influences. You know, we all sit here in this room and use Django because we love Python, but maybe there is something better out there that we don't know of because we are looking at everything through the lens of our Umwelt. Right. So. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we'll just take two more. We've got Thursday and Donna up here. So one of the things that I look at is uh, who locally I'm going to be able to talk to for help. Mm-hmm. And uh, some meetups, for instance, are a lot more welcoming to newcomers or people who are a little bit different from who normally attends than others. So there are some technologies I'm reluctant to touch because of the people involved. Yeah. Thank you. I'd add the the first 30 minutes of the experience of using it is incredibly important because like when I'm trying out a framework or something, I will do the usual pip install thing, play around with it. If I can't get something up and working in that first 30 minutes, then I'm much more likely to bounce off. Right. Very good. Okay. Developer availability. Developer availability. Uh, absolutely. The, the talent pool, et cetera. Okay. So the last thing, uh, uh, last couple notes I want to mention before I move on is that for a new developer, often perception is reality, right? Someone mentioned that their past experiences really color the choices that they make in the future, uh, given that they may not have enough experience to really make um, educated decisions here. Uh, there are a lot of things that um, I didn't list that are a lot more specific. I think Donna, for instance, you mentioned uh, arbitrary checks on a ch- uh, boxes on a check checklist. Right, so is, uh, are you looking for uh, a smooth authoring experience? Are you looking for user roles and permissions, design templates, um, any number of, of things that uh, may be necessary to build something out? The last thing I'll mention here is there are other factors, again, that relate more to how you evaluate an open source project in general um, that aren't listed here that, again, if you're new, you may not have experience with this. You might look at, well, what's the license? Um, what is the leadership like? What's the governance? How's the governance uh, structured? Is it part of a foundation? Uh, how, you know, what's the longevity of the project? How long has it been around? And, and uh, Tim mentioned, for instance, when was the last time it, someone committed to it? Um, how many contributions are there? How active is it over time? And how many contributors are there, period? Um, all really important factors. 
Uh, but I think it really boils down to what's listed here. And I think uh, the, two thing, the three things I heard from you that I think would be really salient for someone new, uh, convincing clients, right? Uh, the arbitrary checkboxes, and yes, language choice, right? What's available? Uh, if, a, if, a, if there's a lot of language X in an environment, well, chances are something that's built in language X is going to be chosen. Okay, moving on. So this is my very rough, unscientific way of comparing frameworks slash content management systems. Um, so uh, just going to go through it real quick. Uh, popularity, obviously, WordPress wins that contest hands down. I don't know, uh, there are few open source, few of any open source projects that have the level of popularity as WordPress. Even if Linux is more popular, WordPress is probably better known among people who aren't in technology. Uh, these ratings are scaled, this is all one to 10, based on, uh, for popularity, it's scaled based on Google Trends. So. Uh, WordPress just takes the cake and everything kind of pales in comparison. So that skews the rest of the ratings there, of course. Uh, Drupal and Django appear to be a little more up in the wings. Rails has, has a little more notoriety, but not by much. Question? I know that microphone. Maybe this is my lack of experience, why are you comparing Django and Rails to WordPress and Drupal? Because they are different platforms and they serve different functions. Yes, thank you for asking that. Um, so that is the massive flaw in this methodology, right? Is that not one of these is not like the others or two of these is not like the others, however you want to look at it. Um, drawing the line between a micro framework and a framework and a content management system, it's blurry, but more or less there are categories there that are relevant to how you evaluate these things. Uh, I'm evaluating Django because, for instance, Wagtail and some of the other content management systems in Python are not as well known, uh, maybe not as large of projects. And if somebody has heard, okay, I want to build, uh, has heard about Python and they want to build an app or website in Python, uh, Django is probably the first thing they're going to hear about. So that's why we're looking at Django here. And uh, yes, to your point, that means all of this data is skewed because these are not, this is not apples to apples. Uh, so uh, documentation, um, every one of these projects really gets this right um, in different ways. The, the amount of tutorials, books, videos, just is an incredible amount of resources out there. And of course, the official project documentation for each of these is also quite spectacular. Um, so not a whole lot to say on that front. Out of the boxiness, uh, I talked about this a little bit ago, um, WordPress, wins hands down because that's what it's meant to do. Uh, you install it and you've got a smooth authoring experience. You've got pretty full featured system on your hands immediately. Um, Drupal comes with a lot of key modules in, uh, installed or at least available uh, on install, but you have to configure the hell out of it to get a decent experience. And certainly if you want to have feature parity with WordPress, there's a lot of contributed modules that you have to add. Um, Django and Rails require more here. Um, and that leads us back to the point the gentleman in the back made, that these are really not um, apples and apples to apples, to apples comparison. Um, and the last thing here in terms of out of the boxiness is that um, Django and Rails are not PHP based. Again, LAMP, LAMP environments are commodity. They're ridiculously cheap and they're everywhere. Um, and often that is just what people are comfortable with, comfortable with or are familiar with. Um, it is getting easier to deploy to other environments with Rails and Python. Um, things like Heroku make it basically trivial. But if you're, getting, you're new to web development, that may not be something you're familiar with. Uh, moving on here, um, security and stability. This is based on data from uh, CVE details, right? So uh, this rating is, this rating is, again, a little bit hand wavy. Um, but Django, from what I can tell, takes the cake here. Now, again, because this is not apples to apples, you'll note that the, uh, the system with the largest uh, surface area in terms of code out of the box is the one with the lowest rating in terms of security and stability, right? Um, WordPress is a massive code base right out, right out the gates. It's also very popular, which makes it a popular target. Um, but from what I could tell, um, Django uh, does really well here in Rails as well. I think one of the challenges 
uh, for WordPress is not just its popularity and the, the surface area, area that can be attacked, but it's also the quality control in the contributed module ecosystem. Right, um, Drupal has a pretty strenuous uh, contribution process. They have a, uh, a paid security team. I believe WordPress uh, also has a paid security team via Automatic, but the the breadth of that ecosystem. No. Oh, they're not paid for. Well, thank you, volunteers. Uh, well, they are very excellent volunteers, and I get uh, emails from them frequently to patch my sites. Um, so. This is a thing where uh, it's not apples to apples, but again, for a person who's researching these things, uh, perception is often reality. So if you're going to choose something and you're worried about security, you might not choose WordPress just because of how often you hear uh, exploits being found for it, or vulnerabilities being found and exploited. Extensibility and ecosystem. Um, every one of these is built with extensibility in mind. Every one of them has a rich ecosystem. Um, these ratings are based on, uh, on discoverability of the ecosystem. Uh, they're not yet based on the size of that ecosystem, because I don't want to factor in size unless I'm also factoring in the quality control, because um, quantity is not always better. Uh, I think, in, based on what I understand, WordPress is a little bit more challenged here, just its architecture is a little older. They don't do as many breaking changes. Um, but all of these really excel there. Now, uh, community, evaluating in terms of community. Here be dragons, and so I'm not going to speculate. Um, but there are important factors that include events, as I mentioned, online forums. Um, that includes Stack Overflow, right? How much does your community actually participate in Stack Overflow? Because that's a lot where a lot of questions are being asked. Um, inclusivity, how pervasive are codes of conduct? How welcome are people from different backgrounds, uh, whether that's their identity or their skill set? Uh, does the community and the leadership value uh, inclusivity? And, and what are the outreach, what's the ecosystem of outreach programs? Uh, what is financial aid availability like uh, in that language or for that framework? So what can Django do to improve? Again, this has all been pretty hand wavy, right? I think we recognize that. Um, and Django stacks up really well in a lot of these areas, as does Python in general. And so there are two things, really, that I've found so far um, that might be areas of improvement, um, you, you could put it that way. Popularity. How does one improve in popularity? Um, you're just not going to overcome the, the inertia, the momentum, rather, that PHP and LAMP hosting has. However, LAMP hosting is an, is an artifact. The availability of it is an artifact of uh, the decade from 2000 to 2010. We're in a new era now, right? As Heroku and things like that become more popular, um, as environments that are easy to install Python and Python-based tools and frameworks in become more available, I think that might shift a little bit. Um, but I think what can be done, other than just wait for that, those large trend lines to, to move, um, is do more cross-pollination with other communities, right? This is something I speak about in my other talks. How much do you, as Django developers, or you as Python developers, how much are you at general web development conferences? How much do you interact with web designers or marketers who might actually be making the technology selection? Right? If you're not talking to these people, then they're not going to know you exist as a, a viable al alternative. Um, Python, in general, seems really great at cross-pollinating as a general purpose language, big in data and, and uh, science and education. I think this is an area where maybe Django could do more. Um, and as I wrap up here, with out of the boxiness, again, this is not really in the philosophy of Django. The goal is not to be an out of the box content management system. It's not a content management system, right? Uh, but perhaps, perhaps it would be useful to have distros of Django, maybe not distros, but some, um, versions of it that have a lot of the uh, necessary modules or ex plugins to meet feature parity with a Drupal or WordPress, um, accessible and well-promoted within the community. And maybe it's not just about having those available, but it's about promoting those in the right way, right? If I'm a new web developer, I might do a fairly, uh, frankly, a fairly clumsy but intuitive web search for WordPress versus Django, right? Are the, how many articles are there out there saying why they're different and how they can be brought together? The rest, Django's rocking. Thank you all for your feedback. I really appreciate it. As I work on the research, I will be sharing what I, what I find. Um, thank you for having me.
Hey, thanks, Josh, for that wonderful talk. Uh, we're out of time, so no more questions. Um, but to give Josh his speaker's mug. Lovely, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're starting again in 10 minutes with Thursday's Bram's um, tutorial on technical blogging. Um, hope to see you there.